When USA Funds was founded in 1960, the only demographics tracked were male and female. But you fast forward to 2014, and Strata Education Network is born from the sale of USA Funds. Today, Strata is a national 501c3 nonprofit with nearly 1,000 employees and headquartered in downtown Indianapolis. And we are dedicated to improving lives through completion with a purpose. In today's grant application, a little bit more than male and female, we capture at least 20 different metrics on every application. So we've, we've changed a little with times as well. Whether it's through our seven affiliates, our investments, our research with Gallup, and the Strata Institute for the Future of Work, or our strategic philanthropy, we are laser focused on innovation solutions, innovative solutions in education to employment. We fund organizations to support high school students in finding the best pathway through secondary education and training to a career with growth potential and for adults in need of reskilling or upskilling to fill the talent pipeline. In many ways, we're working to position people so they qualify for the research work of Dr. Dresner and his peers. It is with pleasure that Strata Network supports initiatives of the Mays Family Institute and this evening's program. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, the world's first school on philanthropy, I'm just honored and delighted to welcome all of you here. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just share a little bit about the Mays Institute for those of you who are uh, familiar or want to learn a bit more. The Mays Institute on Diverse Philanthropy its goal is to foster a greater understanding of the ways that underrepresented people are both inspired and informed donors by providing knowledge, education, and training. The Institute seeks to understand the perceptions, practices, experiences, and needs of the individuals and institutions that uh, racialize philanthropy in underrepresented communities and develop programming and services to engage philanthropic practitioners, scholars, and the public at large in conversations and activities to advance the field. So in short order, we're here to change the conversation, to broaden philanthropy, to make sure that it's inclusive and diverse, and we're inviting all of you to be part of this conversation and journey with us. I'm really honored this evening because we have uh, so many great uh, leaders and champions and advocates in the room. I especially want to call out Dr. Rose Mays, who's here with us this evening, um, our wonderful colleague David Jacobs, who's traveled uh, across uh, the country really to be here, and I think deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. James Winbush, who's also been a wonderful partner and colleague at Indiana University in bringing this uh, vision to life. Uh, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize our wonderful colleagues at Strata, who've been incredible partners for this event, but in many other spheres. So thank you. Um, and to kick us off this evening, I'm going to do two very quick tasks. I'll introduce our moderator, Dr. Jen Shaker. She's going to lead the conversation this evening. But I also have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing another uh, colleague, Rob McPherson, who is the vice president uh, at CICF, the Central Indiana Community Foundation. So I'm going to read their bios so that uh, I get all the details right. Uh, but then I will turn it over to Rob and Jen to take it over for the rest of the evening. So Rob McPherson, um, I have the pleasure of working with him in another role as Vice President of Development and Strategy for CICF. As the Vice President, he directs Asset Development Strategies for CICF. And prior to his joining CICF, he was on the staff of the Arts Council of Indianapolis and Director of Special Projects. 
He's led citywide initiatives. He's also very, a very close friend of the school. Um, he has worked on uh, completing education and training at Indiana University Center on Philanthropy, and also serves as a guest lecturer in our intro class for undergraduates from time to time. So really honored to have Rob here. And then I'm going to turn it also uh, to our moderator for the evening. You're in for a treat if you haven't met Dr. Jen Shaker. She's amazing. Uh, she's going to lead the conversation today. Jen uh, wears two hats. She was an advancement officer for 20 years, so I've known her in her other role. And now she's a colleague at the Lilly Family School. Uh, she served as the Associate Dean for Development and External Affairs for the Indiana University School of Liberal Arts. Um, here at IEPUI and facilitated fundraising, communications, alumni programming, and public events. In 2015, she was recognized nationally as the year's outstanding scholar practitioner by the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Her research focuses on higher education, advancement. She is currently the associate editor of Philanthropy and Education. She's a fellow of the TIAA Institute. And most of her work is intended to contribute both to practice and policy, as well as to enhance understanding of philanthropy. So with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn you over to these visionary uh, leaders here, both Jet and Rob. And I will take a seat and enjoy the rest of, enjoy the rest of the program. I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here, and I love it that I'm not really sharing the stage with Jen, but Jen and I have a, a, a history together in a, in a number of different ways in philanthropy here. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm really honored uh, to introduce Dr. Noah Dresner. Dean Pasek, I really appreciate this invitation uh, to. Uh, introduce Noah and, um, and and I really love our growing partnership that the Lilly Family School has at, uh, with CICF. I'd be remiss not to take this great opportunity to express my gratitude to two other Lilly Family School leaders. Jean Temple, Dean Emeritus, was a mentor to me in many ways a number of years ago and I count him as a dear friend and very important colleague. Even though he's not here, I just felt compelled to publicly acknowledge him and thank him uh, when I had a, a, a the Lilly Family School uh, audience. And an amazing guiding light right now in my career is Una Mosley, who is on the CICF board, as, as she just said, and provides terrific counsel and support to our work and our staff. So Una, thank you for all that you do for us and for me in particular. So I had a, a wonderful phone conversation with Noah Dresner last week. I asked to talk to him because I just didn't want to read his bio to you. You can do that and probably already have. So you know he's an associate professor of higher education at Teachers College, Columbia University, the founding editor of Philanthropy and Education, a new peer-reviewed journal, and is a senior research fellow at the Center of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership at the University of Maryland College Park. You also probably are aware that he's authored or contributed to five books on philanthropy and higher education. <laughs> You might also know that he has lately been focusing his research on the intersectionality of identity groups and philanthropy, which of course has brought him here to us today. So you know all of those things. What you might not know is how and why he got into this field. That's what really interested me about getting to know him a little bit and was the reason for my phone call. Well, I had another reason for the phone call that I uh, wanted to talk to him about his new adventure that he and, and his husband Oren are on right now. I'm not going to steal his thunder and tell you what that is, but because I know he will, and as soon as you see his first slide, um, it'll be apparent, a little teaser. But back to Dr. Dresner's uh, attraction to the field. Like many of us, his interest in philanthropy and career path began as a child. Every week, he looked forward to his mother giving him what he remembers as a crisp, very crisp $1 bill to give to services at the synagogue. Learning Hebrew, he discovered that the word for charity and its practice is tzedakah. And later, learning that the root of tzedek is the Hebrew word for justice. So tzedakah, tzedakah, tzedakah. How am I saying that? Say it again. Tzedakah is charity, and tzedek is the Hebrew word for justice. That's when he decided to pursue this charity thing a little bit more knowing that God's teaching and desire is for our charitable work 
to be rooted in justice. Fast forward to his undergraduate days at University of Rochester, where he pursued and received a science degree. He worked in the alumni office and was assigned to making phone calls to the alumni asking them for money. He was so good at it, they hired him upon graduation, and he continued to be successful in visiting alumni around the country and getting them to give. I love that story because I shared with Noah on the phone that my start in this field also began that way. I was the number one telethon fundraiser at Central Michigan University in the 1980s, and I loved calling alumni, getting, them, getting to know them briefly, and asking them for a contribution on the phone. I actually thought it was a lot of fun. Well, so did Noah. However, he quickly observed that he was not connecting enough with alumni of color. He wasn't closing them at the same rate, he wasn't getting the same dollar amounts, he wasn't even getting the same stories from them as he would their white counterparts. It bothered him, and the answers that he got from his more tenured colleagues and even at professional conferences is that people of color were just not as generous to higher education institutions as whites. A little over 10 years ago, he started researching and writing about these disparities and actually proving the not-as-generous theory wrong and concentrating on identity groups and, and their giving behaviors and philanthropic engagement. However, again, even just 10 years ago, outside groups and publishers were not interested in his articles and, or papers or relegated them to the annual diversity issue of the publication. And actually hearing from one publisher that the research was sound, the article was very good and very compelling, but telling him no one was interested in this subject. This article was about giving amongst the LGBTQ community. We've come a long way, as this is a fast-growing trend in our field. Noah's scholarship has explored the importance of identity within philanthropy towards higher education, having engaged research along the lines of race and ethnicity, gender, ability, religion, and sexuality. I can't wait to learn from Noah. So, Dr. Dresner, welcome to Indianapolis and the Mays Family Institute of Diverse Philanthropy at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at IU. And as you make your way up here with Jen, I give you a crisp one dollar bill to take you back to the roots in our field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for giving such a great introduction. And you, you know, you took my first question. That was so good. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. And so just to give you a little idea of our plan for the rest of the evening, we will have a little conversation. We plan to speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we will be opening the floor to you for your questions. So we hope that you'll be jotting down some questions as we go and that you'll be ready when we are done with your questions. And that's what we're really looking forward to. And I just want to also say that during our conversation tonight, we will be using mostly the terms LGBT and queer. And this is really just for the sake of simplicity in our dialogue. We understand that people identify in many different ways. And we're just very happy that there are so many of you here who come from a cross-section of experience and identity. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And I can tell that my mic is on this side. So if I look this way and you can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> Uh, so, I was going to start with a little question about your personal um, journey to this academic topic. And so we'll skip some of that. Yes, but I we, think we have a few slides uh, up there about yes. uh, the future and, and some hashtags for tonight. Yes. Yes. Good. Okay, then, then we're good. There then, we go. And I apologize in advance if I look down here so I don't turn my back to you just so I can see what you're seeing on the screen and then be able to describe it. So. As we all know, a variety of choices affect our charitable um, decisions, a, a variety of motivations and factors. 
influence how we make those choices. And we, we heard a little bit about Noah's journey and some of the experiences that he's had in his life that impact how he has um, followed his journey. And so we know that uh, this affects us. We know this personally. We know this from the research. There's a great deal of research now about philanthropic motivations. But you focused in a lot of your work on identity-based philanthropy. So what can, why is, what is identity-based philanthropy, and uh, why is this important for us to understand more about? Excellent. So, uh, before I get there, yes. I do want to uh, end the tease that uh, Rob did and introduce you all to uh, Barack Benjamin, who uh, uh, just turned 12 weeks on Sunday. It's my first... Uh, trip away from him, um, and I'm on paternity leave right now, so this is actually like the longest, uh, the long, before this trip, the longest I was away from him was about four hours, so uh, I don't know what I'm experiencing, uh, but um, so Barack there is in a, in a Lilly family school onesie that says that uh, he's a future philanthropist. And uh, I, I actually think that I should have crossed that out and, and uh, Barack is already a philanthropist because building off of my uh, mother's tradition, my mother passed away when I was uh, 10 years old, uh, but building off her uh, tradition, Orrin and I, my husband, decided that we are going to uh, teach him from a very early age about philanthropy. So what we've decided to do is for every, as Shabbat begins, as the Sabbath begins on Friday, every day, every Friday, we're giving him 18 quarters to put away. And the reason why 18 is the uh, number in uh, numerology in Hebrew, 18 is life. So for each week, it's going to be $4.50 that he'll get to put away. Right now, he doesn't have the dexterity yet to put it in, 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 in the little box, but we're trying very quickly to, to do that by week 15. Um, but, uh, and this idea would be then, what, at his birthday, that he'll get to choose the, the cause that he wants to give uh, his uh, work to. So he'll be a dollar uh, uh, more in, in, the, in, in, uh, in his uh, kitty uh, uh, this year. But, um, you know, Rob shared a lot about uh, my personal story of how I got in, into this work. But it, it really is, I think most of us who get involved in uh, development work as fundraisers or philanthropists as giving away money are doing it for very personal reasons. We have motivations, and many of those motivations lie within uh, our different identities and the different traditions that we were brought up in. So whether it was my mother giving me that crisp dollar bill, or other teachings that I taught, that's where identity-based philanthropy comes from for me. From a more scholarly and academic aspect of it, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation in 2012 defined identity-based philanthropy as a growing movement to democratize philanthropy from the grassroots up. Simply described, it's the practice of raising and leveraging resources by and from a community on its own behalf, where a community is defined not by geography, but race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. And we could expand that on to uh, further identities as well. Other identities as well. That's the basis of my conception of identity-based uh, philanthropy that drives my work. But as we continue to have this conversation, and you got from the title, and where, we're, where hopefully we're going to go today, I've expanded it to not just be the philanthropy that is going to a community on one's own behalf, but how is identity impacting people's giving towards general causes that are outside of their own community as well? Because it would be incorrect for us to think that we only are um, impacted by our identity when doing something for people like ourselves. So in the past, a 
lot of the research about philanthropy and philanthropic motivations uh, really focused on the majority <coughs> community. Now, of course, we know the majority is changing, but I will say it largely focused on white, straight men, older men. And so, and wealthy, yes, how could I forget that, yes. Uh, so, what's, what's the problem with focusing the research in that way? What happens? Sure, so I, I tend to call this the vicious cycle. Um, earlier today, before I caught a typo, I typed the uh, viscous cycle. So, <laughs> thankfully, we caught that earlier, but that could be a whole different conversation for, uh, for later over a couple of drinks, maybe. But um, <laughs> this vicious cycle is starts with a focus on philanthropy being around money. Obviously, we do need large gifts. Obviously, there's a need for uh, large-scale giving in the philanthropic work that we're doing, whether it's for higher education or for other nonprofits. But when we think about true philanthropy and that it's accessible to all people, that doesn't necessarily mean we should be focusing uh, solely on money. It's about participation, it's about bringing people in, it's, it's engaging them where they are and at the level of donation that they can, can make, and that could be just as valuable as the large-scale gift in many ways. But when we focused on money, it meant that traditional solicitations then focused on these white, wealthy, heterosexual men where the, where the vast majority of dollars was. Well, when you focus on the dollars and you focus on where that money lies, it leads to the creation of culturally insensitive solicitations where we're only speaking to one person. And then we wonder why, as you heard in uh, Rob's intro to me, why people aren't successful with closing gifts of, from alumni of color or people of color or people with other uh, gender identities, etc., because we're actually not speaking to them and we're not honoring their understandings and their identities and their cultures of giving. <clears throat> so once you create uh, culturally insensitive uh, solicitations, that leads you to have less marginalized alumni or less marginalized people participating, and then people assume they're not generous and they're not going to give. So you're right back at the beginning of the cycle of only centering on this one population. So by doing this, re this research and by engaging in this conversation and trying to broaden our understanding of philanthropy mm -hmm. and how philanthropy works, we actually open the opportunity to do more culturally inclusive philanthropy and increase the donor base um, at the same time and push back on this question that the money is only going to come from one specific type of person. Mm -hmm. So, let's get into the meat of our conversation, right? The, ti the title, and why many of you are here, is to learn more about what we know about LGBT donors from the research, and then what we know in particular in relation to higher education. Sure. Take us away. <laughs> Take us away. Okay, sure. So, I think, um, so I'll, I'll, the um, work that I'm presenting tonight is from uh, a number of different studies, uh, primarily from uh, two studies. One is the National LGBT Alumni Study that I did with my then uh, graduate student, Jason Garvey, who's now a, uh, well, is just heard that he got tenure at the University of Vermont, which is very exciting and also makes me... I feel very old that one of my doctoral students has tenure someplace, but um, that's fantastic. Um, and also from a, uh, the National Alumni Giving Experiment. So I'm going to be interchanging two different um, uh, studies. But the National uh, LGBT Alumni Study was a mixed method study where we started off really with qualitative interviews with um, LGBT identified uh, people and also uh, advancement officers to better understand uh, their giving and think about how once we had a better understanding if we can conceptualize it into 
a quantitative study that would be more generalizable across multiple institutions in the U.S. And one of the uh, most um, surprising study uh, findings from the qualitative portion was the unconscious influences that LGBT identity was having on people skin. From my prior work, which, um, as Rob mentioned, I'm going to be just referring to Rob's uh, introduction <laughs> to me since he gave so much of, uh, of my story already, which is fantastic. Uh, I started off doing most of my look work looking around uh, Rick's. And in that work, when I asked, how does your race impact your giving? Very quickly, I was hearing ideas of racial uplift. When I was looking within uh, marginalized racial communities or, or my, my, uh, minority uh, religious groups, um, I would hear about the importance of uplifting within their faith communities, etc. But when I first asked, um, how does your queer identity impact your giving? Almost to a T, everyone says, it didn't. But then, as a good qualitative researcher does, you don't say, okay, well, end of study, thank you. <laughs> um, I asked follow-up questions. And once we delved in further into why they give to their alma mater, what would cause them not to give to their alma mater, what caused them to give to a specific scholarship, their queer identity was involved in almost every answer that they gave, in direct ways, in indirect ways, etc. And it led me to wonder, why is it that this marginalized community is thinking differently than other marginalized communities and not ready to consciously claim uplift as one of their motivating factors? And I know that one of the later questions that we're going to get to is, what are the burning questions uh, of research within uh, this topic, I'm just going to identify that now as being a place where we need a lot more research to better understand what are the dynamics that are going on within these communities um, that are not allowing for someone to feel comfortable to claim that space, or uh, in which, or preventing not even able to fully articulate um, what's holding them what's back. What's holding it back? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what were some of the things I'm going to? I'm breaking in. I'm off script already. So what were some of the things that they said that uh, some examples from the interviews, perhaps that kind of signal to you this underlying influence that they didn't recognize themselves. So they would they they would say no I. I Identity doesn't play a role, but um, you know, if there were ever a uh, um, a homophobic president of the institution, I'd stop giving on a dime. Or, oh, um, I think scholarships are are very important. So um, I reached out to my institution and. Uh, set up a uh, scholarship for uh, queer athletes. Well, how did that, you set up a scholarship for LGBT individuals, but you didn't think that your identity played a role in that. that that's yeah. that's uh, surprising. really surprising that they were giving really concrete answers as to where they were giving and how they, at the time, in some ways, going or circumventing the university's lack of support for LGBT students. Um, in one case, at one uh, uh, Big Ten institution, not this one, uh, uh, they, there was someone who wanted to set up a um, athletic scholarship, I think I mentioned this, uh, uh, for an LGBT uh, student, and at first they said they wouldn't be able to do that, they wouldn't know how to ask the question, they didn't know the legal ramifications, blah, blah, blah. So they ended up setting up a uh, scholarship, quite stereotypically, for a male cheerleader. 
with the, with the assumption that there are some stereotypes of what, around male cheerleaders, which we can then get into questions around is that appropriate or internalized homophobia there, etc. But it's, a, it's an example of circumventing the institutional rules of being told they couldn't set this up for their identity, but then it, it was the same person who told me they don't think about their identity in, their, in, in that given space. So those are some examples off the top of my head. Yeah, thank you. So am I ready to turn to the news, or do you want to, and what happens on campus? Oh, no, I'll, I'll keep on going. Then. Okay, keep on going, going a little first. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, So after the, after the qualitative work was done, we, we did it. We did do a uh, a, a, a national survey that I'll get to um, a little bit later. Some of the results when we get to talk about how can we operationalize this on campus. But I mentioned that there was another study that I'm drawing on, and that is uh, the National Alumni uh, Giving Experiment, in which I did a um, a field experiment. Uh, or a laboratory experiment, I should say, um, with alumni to see how uh, identity operates in annual fund solicitations. And the idea behind that, that I was trying to better understand, and this was more generally, uh, more general around identity than just LGBT uh, identities, so there was race involved, etc., uh, first generation status as well, um, was this concept of philanthropic mirroring. So philanthropic mirroring, uh, oops, that's in advance. Uh, philanthropic mirroring, I'm trying to uh, give you a little uh, <coughs> visual example of that. On the top, you'll see a standard uh, philanthropic uh, solicitation. And there's this concept, there's this theoretical concept that there's social distance between two people or two groups. So when you have a prospective donor, a prospective donor, the social distance between them and a profile scholarship recipient is this distance. And the idea of philanthropic mirroring that I was trying to say was if, if in some way in the solicitation we put up a mirror and reflected the identity or the identities <laughs> of the prospective donor back at them, the social distance would reduce and the likelihood of giving a gift, seeing the importance of that scholarship uh, recipient would increase, as well as potentially the size of the gift would, would increase. So we did this through a, an experiment where there were multiple different solicitations, uh, people were given different profiles of students, we manipulated the name, gender, race of the student, some of the students uh, identified as LGBT that were uh, getting the scholarship. Some students were just in general need. Some students were um, not necessarily in need, but were uh, great scholars and we want to uh, support them generally, just to tease out the different ways uh, in which uh, this mirroring could and could not work. And the truth is that I was having a long conversation with uh, uh, I wrote earlier uh, today that we did see mirroring that occurred. Well, more exciting than once figuring out that the mirroring was occurring, um, where people, when they saw themselves donated, we saw that there was a shared marginalized identity, which meant that people who identified as one as having any minority identity were more likely not only only to support themselves, but to support others in other minority groups um, as well. So I'm going to share a little bit of those uh, about of those results. So I hate sharing numbers, so I try to do it visually. So what I'm going to to show you are predictive probabilities, and a predictive probability is basically a within this group. What's the percentage that this action is going to take place, take place based on all of the data that we collected? Okay, so you're going to see uh, bar charts uh, with percentages on them 
that's the percentage likelihood that this action is going to take place. Okay? Don't worry about the details. There's certainly not a quiz at the end. Just for illustrative purposes. So here, you're going to see some uh, predictive probabilities of giving a scholarship to different students by the race of the student. Now, each bar graph is the identity group of the donor. So for instance, here is, these are our white donors in the sample, or non-donors in the sample. Blacks, Latinx, men, women, LGBT, second generation plus, so meaning people who has at least one parent with a college degree or more, and first generation college students. And then within each bar, we have the profile students' race. So the first bar is white students, the second bar is black students, and the third bar is Latinx students. So you'll see, for instance, that within the, for the purposes of our discussion today, within the LGBT community, you're seeing increases in giving to students of color. We also see amongst uh, blacks, we see increases in giving to blacks and to uh, Latinx students, etc. So you're, you're seeing here that those people with marginalized identities, blacks, black, uh, women, LGBT, and first gen, you're seeing an increase in giving in these uh, two positions to the right, right? The minor, uh, marginalized students there. Um, and you see a little bit of a dip in uh, the Latinx community, though that's an interesting question as well. This also con uh, continues to our question today around uh, sexual orientation, where you're seeing the marginalized populations also giving to higher numbers of LGBT students. LGBT students here are the darker uh, orange all the way uh, to the right. So you're, again, I'm showing this to show you that marginalized identities are not just giving to themselves at a higher rate, but they are giving to other marginalized identities. And this also um, holds true uh, for first generation uh, status. So I don't want to bore you too much uh, with the details, but it's really interesting how this is not just giving to oneself, but giving to others in which there's some sort of kinship of being marginalized, or some sort of understanding, I, don't, I haven't lived your life experience, but from my own life experience, I might have some idea of what your experience <coughs> is, and I want to support you as well. So just to ask another quick follow-up question on that, about kind of the, the, some of the practical outcomes of that information, and maybe the, the interesting finding that um, for the um, white survey respondents, it was kind of the same across the board, right? Mm -hmm. And so, as we think about something like that as, as in raising money for the university, and I, I know coming to some of this yep. later, but what does that tell us about kind of, you know, um, how we speak to people, right, in our messaging? Sure, that's a great question. So, so, the, so the first way I tried to do this, uh, this work uh, and to do the data analysis of this, I was looking just at creating a scale of identity. So if you share one, uh, identity with the student that was profiled, you got a one. If you share two uh, uh, identities with the student profiled, so like race and gender, you got two points. If it was race, gender, and LGBT status, you got three points. And I expected to see the higher the number of points you had on that identity scale, the stronger the mirroring was going to work. And that was based off of 10 years of qualitative research, and I was like, this is how it's going to operate, I'm going to have an easy paper uh, to go out, and let me tell you that is not how it works. Um, and the reason was, 
to cut many months of aggravation and literal, literal head pounding on my desk and wondering if I had messed up all of my politics work somehow <laughs> or what I was doing wrong uh, uh, as I was venturing off into this experimental research. It wasn't until I realized that we needed to be thinking about whiteness differently in this research than we were thinking about marginalized identities. And after having a uh, great conversation actually with a Indiana University uh, fr uh, Bloomington uh, professor who just asked the right questions at the right frustrating moment uh, to, to get me to think about whiteness, once I took the white identity out, the mirroring story started to emerge. And then I had to think about why that was. And where I came on it was that since being white in the US is the norm, when you held up a mirror to a white donor of a white student, they didn't see themselves, they just saw a student. So the mirror didn't work on them because there was a norming aspect to whiteness, right? So that's condensing like four years of like heartache <laughs> to get to two sentences. But I think it allows us to uh, think about our messaging, right? Oftentimes, development officers in, in higher education worry a lot about which, who are the students that they're profiling, who are they going to be telling the stories of. And I think that we need to feel more comfortable with sharing diverse stories and diverse students with all of our alumni, but at the same time being extraordinarily careful not to tokenize those students, right? And as we change what the norm is of a student, and as that's changing on our college campus, then we might need to be thinking about what, how whiteness operates in that idea. But we're not there yet, and I don't think that we should spend too much time continuing to center the conversation on whiteness and philanthropy, because there's plenty of other people who uh, have done that work, and we need to be thinking about how these identities uh, operate differently mm -hmm. and, and in generous ways. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, better than my phrasing uh, deserves. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm sure many of us have heard in the news recently the um, the information about the Methodist Church and um, the decision by the delegates by the majority of the delegates to um, vote, vote against inclusion in that church. And you may have also followed uh, the news regarding the effect that this is having on college campuses, <coughs> particularly Methodist college campuses. And I, I was just reading a little bit more this afternoon that for many years there's been a large contingent of Methodist colleges, something nearly 100, that have been signing a petition and asking the church to please, you know, vote in favor of inclusivity in those are values they hold on their campuses. And I'm um, talking about some well-known well institutions like Duke, Southern Methodist, many others across the country. So as we hear those stories, I couldn't help but to wonder, you know, what effect do things um, in the greater environment from news like that to legal policies, so what kind of effect is that having on our campuses and then and, and on our LGBT students and faculty and staff? And then how does this all relate back to philanthropy and giving um, among L the LGBT population to their alma maters and other colleges that they care about? Yeah, you know, I think that this is a, uh, this is a great question and obviously from the the root from the headlines aspect of, of the question. There's no, there's no answer yet in terms of 
uh, particularly uh, Methodist institutions, but we know that we know from plenty of research, uh, some of which is mine, but plenty of other research within higher education that's not even uh, delving into the philanthropy side, the importance of sense of belonging and the importance of uh, being able to be oneself on a college campus and that impact that it has on multiple outcomes. Philanth philanthropic giving is one of them, but it extends to retention of students and graduation rates and um, all levels of uh, educational outcomes. So I think that as institutions of higher education tend to be liberalizing forces. But when you have uh, movements that are outside of them that are trying to contain that liberalizing force or are restricting that ability uh, for students to feel comfortable being themselves, in this case, their, their out selves, uh, while, yes, for this conversation today, I'm worried about uh, what that's going to mean in the future for alumni giving. Quite honestly, my larger concern right now is how is that going to impact those, that student, student retention and uh, movement towards actual graduation, et cetera. So I think that there are lots of large questions that we need to be uh, thinking about. And in a minute, I'll show um, how that sense of belonging and that opportunity to um, to engage truly has a uh, impact on uh, the LGBT community. Yeah. Well, and so let's talk a little bit more about kind of um, learning from the research and um, for uh, professionals who are trying to build that sense of um, belonging among alumni and donors. And so what, what do institutions need to learn and can they take from some of the things we've been talking about? Absolutely. absolutely. So I mentioned earlier that uh, from the National LGBT uh, Alumni Giving Study, there was, alumni study, there was um, a quantitative portion. And so stepping off of that, uh, some uh, work that we've been doing is trying to build off of uh, some of the foundational research that has looked at alumni giving. And many of you who are students in this class or are uh, scholars might uh, know uh, the work of Monks and Klopfelter, uh, which basically um, took um, academic involvement and co-curricular activities and personal finances to understand the impacts of the, uh, those different um, parts of one's academic identity and then uh, alumni identity, their personal finances, uh, into um, whether people were going to give and how much. So for instance, here, uh, Monks and Klopfelter both looked at, is there differences by major in terms of uh, giving? If you were a student government leader, is that, are you more likely to be a donor than if you were in a political uh, affiliated group or a Greek group and all of this aspect? And obviously, um, the finance part comes into what kind of disposable income you have when you're able to be a donor. What we tried to do was add in this identity-based uh, motivation. Um, and identity-based identity motivation uh, theory basically is saying that people act in identity so basically, we try to say, okay, yes, academic uh, involvement major is going to have an impact, co-curricular involvement is going to have an impact, obviously the level of disposable income that you have when you're asked is, is going to have an impact as well, but we wanted to add in this question of the queer experience on campus as well, and how that has an impact on lifetime giving. And just to give you one more predictive probability, and I promise no more bar graphs and percentages, but when asked, um, when we ask students to rate on a one to five scale, their sense of the campus climate uh, for queer students when they were on campus, so not what they perceive it to be right now, we ask that question as well. 
um, but what, what they, how they felt as a queer student, how their sense of belonging was at the time that they were a student, we can see here that as their sense of campus climate uh, increases, the likelihood that they were going to be a higher lifetime giving donor, so they were going to give more across their lifetime, increases as well. So you see here that the percentage of giving still is nice around those with low at 54%, but 65% is quite higher, high, is much higher as well when you think about it um, in uh, standardized terms. This also um, held true, I'm not going to share all the numbers with you, I can happily do that uh, again over drinks later if people are interested, but this also held true for um, LGBT uh, alumni that used um, LGBT related services uh, on campus, whether it's counseling services or participating in LGBT centers or participated in co-curricular activities that were specifically um, for uh, the queer community on campus. And interestingly, also you would see a very similar graph uh, based on the number of LGBT out faculty and staff they personally knew as well. And that's another sign for uh, a positive campus culture or campus climate that faculty and staff felt comfortable living their, their true selves as well on campus and that affected the students as well. What was the age range of people surveyed? So this survey was from, I, I can look at the exact numbers, but we surveyed anyone who was um, they had to have been at least one full year out of their alumni experience, um, and they could be as many years out as took the survey. It was an online survey, so it skewed somewhat uh, younger in, in range, um, but uh, I can look up afterwards quickly on my computer uh, what the average age range was. I think, if I'm remembering correctly, the average age was um, around 42 years old or so. Um, I think what you're really getting at in terms of a question is, for some older alumni, they weren't going to have the exposure to um, as many LGBT-directed services on college campuses as well, or might have had less exposure to out uh, faculty and staff. And it is true when we uh, look at age that there was a generational effect some of those answers as well. Is that where you're getting on with your question? Sort of time. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you kind of previewed this next question a little bit. And um, as you think about the research that's been done, your research, and the work of others, there are a few others also working in this space. I mean, not, not, a, not a ton. Um, but what are the burning questions? What are your burning questions? Um, and we heard about one that relates to kind of this um, difficulty in acknowledging the influence of identity among uh, LGBT donors. So what are some of the other things that are on your mind that you're, or that you're hoping people will join you in this research area and, and help? Yeah. yeah. So, Quickly before I answer that uh, question, I realize I didn't fully answer oh. the last question um, that I think might be the baby brain lack of sleep. But um, so, what can colleges do? Yeah. I think was really what the what the question yeah. was that I we got into the research and then I got That's into true. research and, yeah. and, and all that. So I think that college campuses need to be thinking about the support services that, that they're doing for all marginalized communities. And we're getting much, much better on college campuses in terms of increasing the support services uh, for diverse students. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be uh, done there. And while I think we should be doing that work because it's the right thing to be doing, and it's the um, right way to support our students, to be their true self. Sometimes some administrators who are not necessarily fully woke to that idea need to have financial incentives to do that. So if you're one of those 
uh, people who need to talk to awaken or or help woke uh, someone who has the pur purse strings, you can talk about it as a good investment in alumni giving uh, in the future. Shouldn't be the motivation, but if that has to be the motivation to get uh, uh, better uh, diverse uh, support services for our students, we'll take we'll take it the way uh, that we can, maybe. But I think so. I think that uh, the other aspect of it is that in terms of that's with students. In terms of with alumni, institutions need to move away from being scared about actually collecting demographic data and recording it. So many institutions are not willing to resurvey their alumni or ask them if they identify as part of the queer community or move away from racial categories that are check one box. We know that there are so many of our students and so many of our alumni that identify as multiracial, but we on uh, admissions forms only gave, you can only choose one box, so people had to decide what they were at the time or their conception of how they identify has changed over time and hasn't updated in alumni databases. We need to do a better job at allowing people to self-identify and we need to do a better job at not being fearful, specifically around LGBT identities, mm -hmm. recording that information. The truth is that all of our alumni are quite smart. They know when they're talking to an alum, uh, a development officer or an alumni relations officer, if they're giving information that could be used somehow. So if someone identifies to you as being gay, if I say that to uh, someone in my alma mater, it's because I want you to. If I didn't want you to know that identity, I wouldn't have shared it. So it's actually honoring them by recording it and actually using it. Not in creepy ways and not in tokenizing ways. But if someone's willing to share who they are with you, it's actually honoring them to take that information and do something with it. So now, getting okay. to, to, yes. to uh, yes. the last question, yes. which I need you to remind me. And this will be my last question as well. So, um, burning, question, burning questions, things we don't know and need to know more. So, I, so that we can get to uh, questions in the audience, I think the largest burning question that I have after uh, looking at multiple identities for the past 15 years or so uh, in this work, <coughs> is we're getting good emerging research identity by identity, but we, but all of us are complex human beings made up of multiple identities. So how does this work from a intersecting, intersection of multiple identities work? And how and where do philanthropic motivations inspire the saliency or the creeping up of one identity over another. So this, I think, is an incredibly important question that has great implications, but from a research design perspective, is... <laughs> I don't, I, I've been, listen, I've been trying for years to figure out how to, to create the research design, and, and I haven't come up with anything that, uh, that, I'm, that I think would actually get to this question. I don't think that that means that, we, that there's no way of doing this research. It's just partnering with the right people and for more people to start thinking about this research, because to think about people in a one dimension of identity is clearly not enough and really think about these intersections and these multiple identities will allow us to build, from a theoretical perspective, a dynamic understanding of philanthropic motivations, but also from a practitioner perspective, could revolutionize the way that we engage people in 
transactional uh, solicitations like the annual fund, but also uh, in major gift solicitations where you're having more personal relationships as well. Um, and I think it's really exciting from both a research and a practice uh, standpoint. Yeah. So that's the biggest burning question, and if anyone has ideas on how to do that research, please let me know. See this gentleman later. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for allowing me to ask all these many questions. And now we would like to invite you to ask questions. And Amy has a microphone. She'll try to get to you. But as we were talking earlier, there is no center aisle in this room. It's hard for her to get around. So if you have a question, just raise a hand or give us an indication that you have something in mind for our guests. First of all, congratulations, Dan, Papa, oh. Dad, whatever it is. <laughs> I'm, going, um, I'm going by Abba, Abba, which is Hebrew for Dad. Yeah, sure, it's great. Um, what do you do? You have any sense about the current volatile political climate as being a motivator also for some of this, some of the giving that happens in marginalized in the marginalized populations, the marginalized alumni, because of a concern of kind of um, at least you know, what the current, um, the current political climate is like? Um, so not off of my own research, and I think that there's, uh, some, there's, from my understanding, at least within the higher education uh, space, uh, limited research that's uh, been looking at the uh, current uh, political environment, but I do think that um, specifically within uh, the LGBT community, we had some large questions after marriage equality around what's next? Will gay philanthropy, where, where is gay dollars going to go? Uh, because we solved it. First of all, the idea that with marriage equality that we solved all of the LGBT uh, equity issues in the United States is a uh, farce and also, again, quite honestly saying that we're uh, again, refocusing not necessarily on heterosexual uh, white men, but for the most part, focusing that question, that that answer on uh, gay white men, and letting the rest of our LGBT community fall to the side if we think that there's no other problems. It was a big win for our communities, but it wasn't everything. Um, I think that you can tell from the current political environment that we've been seeing some backsliding. There's plenty to do on college campuses. Um, Specifically, we're still seeing more and more students who, even though there's so much more uh, acceptance of LGBT students and so many more uh, people are coming out at younger ages in high school or middle school, etc., we're still seeing students who come to college feel comfortable to find themselves and to come out. They share that with their parents and their parents financially disown them and then they have no way to continue at that institution. So, whether the political environment or just the larger environment of still needing to do this work for equity and for acceptance of uh, queer people, there's plenty to do. Um, so I know that I really didn't answer your question, but it, um, it gave me an opportunity to, to push back on We've solved it all, yeah. which is not the case. Thank you. In addition to, coming on. In addition to the wraparound services that you mentioned to support the students in the LGBTQ community, what other institutional changes do organizations and development teams need to make to create that environment to prepare future donors? And I ask because a research paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research that was published last year talked about the upswing of chief diversity officers being implemented in universities. But when you look at the data of tenure track professors where this chief diversity officers have been implemented, you see very little change in terms of faculty composition, which is one of the main indicators of future giving. So are institutions even ready for these changes in the data that you found? And if not, what do they need to do to get there? 
Wow, that, that, that could be the conversation of for a, 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 a full semester. In fact, I teach a course around these, some of these issues uh, um, back at uh, TC. But I don't think the lack of progress at institutions that have implemented chief diversity officers is a sign that chief diversity officers are not having an impact or not able to be part of the solving of this problem. I think it's an indication of how big the problem has been and continues to be. That's going to take more than a handful of years or a decade of this work for us to move the needle in a significant way. Um, the issues, particularly around faculty, can't be solved just by targeted faculty hires. They need to be solved by making, earlier in the pipeline, by making sure that people with um, marginalized identities are going to graduate school. Once they're in graduate school, are getting the experience and the mentorship and the support to feel like they can go on a tenure track. But it needs to go before that because we need to be increasing the number of people who are qualified and have the passion to go to graduate school. So we need to be thinking about how they got into school. And then we need to go further back, all the way through the K through 12 system in order to make these changes, right? And then we need to be thinking about, once they get on the tenure track, what are the systematic, institutionalized racism, institutionalized homophobia, institutional gender, uh, institutionalized gender bias that is affecting these faculty members from being successful on the faculty track as well, right? So, that is a mountain of work to do. And to put that on a chief diversity officer and expect them to solve it overnight is not practical. My fear, though, is that some institutions don't get that. And they're going to say, well, we tried. What's next? Right? It's not working. This is a long road ahead of us. And we as institutions of higher education need to not be only working in our sphere around it, but we need to be giving the support to earlier on in the educational spheres to do this work as well. So that's really where schools of education making sure that they're working to diversify the pipeline throughout to get us there. Uh, is important too. It's not just our own backyard, it's a whole societal conversation that needs to be there. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm just curious if any of your research or research of others have looked at small religious institutions in the context of identity, this question comes out of fear of small religious institutions, in particular small universities, doing some dramatic actions to prevent inclusion, um, including one that I'm aware of that it seems that they're trying to move towards not having any federal funding through federal student loan grants to be able to essentially discriminate, for lack of a better term of mm -hmm. defining that. Has any of your research looked at that, um, those specific institutions, in the hopes that maybe even those institutions can kind of become more inclusive and grow along with the rest of us? Uh, so, so my research ha has not looked at it. Uh, those institutions, we did have some uh, small religious institutions in our sample, but they happen to be HBCUs, uh, start with black colleges and universities, and their identity, um, the institutional identity, and uh, operates differently than 
uh, predominantly white institutions that would be small and religious as well, so I don't think that it's uh, comparable. But that's a, that's a fascinating uh, research question on, on multiple levels in terms of uh, what that impact will be and also how strong our convictions might be in order to uh, forego all federal funding, right. et cetera. Hi, uh, Noah. Uh, earlier we were talking about um, Indiana University's efforts to establish identity-based giving circles, and I had asked you, do you see this anywhere else in higher ed? And you said, it hasn't been done very well. So as we venture into this realm, could you share some, uh, some tips or some things that you've seen on things that we should be cognizant of as we begin to develop these giving circles? Sure. Um, I think I think I started answering that question uh, too earlier, but for the benefit of, of the the whole audience, um, I think that um, the power of the giving circle, in my mind, is the collectivist nature of it, in which you work as a group to determine the where the funds are going to go, and that also means that you're learning together about um, the areas uh, that might benefit, and also sometimes you might not win, right? You might, no matter how the giving circles rules of decision making are, whether it's consensus or whether it's uh, by a more democratic process of one person, one vote, or per percentage of uh, the vote based on the level of giving to uh, the circle, you might not get the cause that you expected, right? But there's a power in that because you're creating a community, right? At the institutions that I haven't seen it work well at is where institutions of higher education I love them so dearly, right? I've devoted my life to higher education, the study of higher education. We like to control everything, right? So we want to control what the priorities are, and we want to say, well, giving circle A, here are what we want you to do. And we'll give you some choice so that you can have a choice, but from this menu of options. Where I think it's going to be more impactful from a um, from building a philanthropic community in which people are wanting to continue to give and continue to be part of, institutions are going to have to loosen that control a little bit and allow the members of that circle, those circles, to really have true decision making power over where their gift goes. Now are there ways to make sure that we're not giving uh, too much donor control and things are going to be funded that the institution does not want, does not need, or that are not mission-centric? Yes, we need to be thinking about those questions. But the likelihood is that there are so many things that the institution needs that this giving circle can contribute to that they're not going to jump for the things that you don't want or you don't need. It's about giving them the education and the room uh, to grow. If people are empowered in their philanthropy and really truly believe within the giving circle that their voice counts and the process counts, I think that you're going to see very successful uh, return uh, to uh, join the circle in the next iteration or continuing uh, to participate. If it's fake, where it's basically decided earlier it's going to be A, B, or C, and that's all the things, people are going to be like, well, that's the same thing as getting a annual fund solicitation and being told that I can designate to one of three different options. Why do I need to be part of this process? For some, that might work, but those who are drawn to giving circles, I just don't think that that's going to be a strong motivator. And then I think we have one final question. 
couple, a couple questions that sort of come down to the same thing about the research mode and so forth. Um, Jen told us to overlook the fact that LGBTQ were lumped together, but the fact of the matter in your research, you have to be having distinctions between L and G and B and T and Q and plus. Uh, so I, I'm wondering what you're seeing there. And, and then secondly, uh, if I understand correctly, all of your research has been uh, di sorry, directed toward higher education. Um, it may be ultra-virus to ask whether you have any notions of how this research would apply as well to social services and the like outside of uh, higher education. Great questions. Um, in terms of breaking out uh, across the multiple identities um, within uh, the LGBTQ plus 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 communities. Um, we chose not to do much of that breakout in the quantitative work um, for the simple reason of wanting to make sure that we had enough statistical power uh, to do um, what we wanted to do. And that's the downside of quantitative work is that you do need to have uh, sizable pots of respondents in order to do that, which lets to not break it up. Do I, do I think that you're raising a really important question uh, for continued research in terms of making sure that we have overall studies that are large enough with representation for from uh, different identity groups within the LGBT community? Absolutely, 100%, I agree with you, and that is a limitation of the studies that we have now. From the qualitative work, um, while we did see some differences um, across different identity groups, the they weren't as different as I expected to, to find, which raises to me this larger question that I said is the burning question of multiple identities. Where, how is race and how is gender also impacting giving within the gay community or within the lesbian community, et cetera? And it didn't tease out the way that I, I, uh, I suspected that it was going to, at least amongst uh, those that we interviewed. So I know I'm not giving you very satisfying answers, but um, I think you asked fantastic questions because it's showing how much more research uh, needs to be done. In terms of um, the impact outside of higher education, I think that there that there there are some impacts that are possible. One thing, the a lot of the original LGBT uh, philanthropy research focused on queer giving to queer causes. One of the reasons why I was really excited about using it within doing this work within the higher education context was because it gave me the ability to think about queer giving to not only queer causes, to general scholarships, to larger um, non-LGBT aspects of, of, um, of institutions. So I think that there's going to be different impacts on whether the social service organization is LGBT focused itself or whether it is more of a mainstream social service uh, provider. And I do think that it allows us to think about how those nonprofits are collecting demographic data amongst 
their donors. Most of the time, they have much less donor, uh, much less information about their donors than higher education does. So I think that we're not necessarily there yet to do um, really large scale research, but there is a good opportunity for some uh, small qualitative uh, research and to really get to your answer. So again, I feel like you're asking great questions, and I'm just not giving you real answers. <laughs> I apologize. Um, it's interesting to know what's happening. Yeah. Well, thank you all. We have uh, one last um, time for us to say goodbye. And we so appreciate you being here. And I'm going to invite um, Jackie, who is the, the director of the library here in Indianapolis, to come. Thank you, Jen. I'm Jackie Nitas, the CEO for your public library. I know many of you here this evening. And I want to thank you for being here. But this is the kind of program that we want your public library auditorium to be used for, and we're very grateful to the School of Philanthropy for bringing several sessions of your series here. This is exactly the kind of exploration. You have touched on so many of today's topics, actually beyond the simple title of your talk. And so any others of you who are involved in any of this good, thoughtful work on many fronts, if you're looking for a forum to explore it, come to us. We're happy to have you here. I do want to share with you all this evening um, just a, a little bit of advanced announcement of something that relates to tonight's topic. I know many of you came here tonight to discuss fundraising, but you also came because you are interested in a greater understanding of the GLBTQ community. And we are embarking on an effort this year that I believe will be very helpful in that regard. We are now the recipient of the Chris Gonzalez collection that has up until now been um, in the basement of the old St. Mary's Church downtown. And um, some aspects of the collection, the ones that are in a true local historical um, primary documents nature are gone to the historical society which is quite appropriate, but the six or 7,000 books from the collection will be coming here, and they will form one of the larger collections of the GLBTQ information in a major public library, so we're very excited about this. This will launch later in the summer. Um, I think if you uh, pay attention to Pride, the organization Pride here in town, they will be putting out a lot of the announcements about the celebration and things. So just know that um, it's coming, and perhaps will be a chance for people to dig deeper into understanding audiences and uh, research topics, and uh, hopefully be of use to all of you. So thank you again for coming this evening, and I hope that your public library can continue to meet your needs for this great kind of information. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for hosting us in this uh, beautiful space. And I want to thank uh, Una and our wonderful speakers, Noah and uh, Jen, for this wonderful discussion. I also want to thank Amy Connolly for helping to organize this wonderful event. Uh, I also want to thank you for being with us, and I hope you share our sense of pride of being part of uh, Indianapolis and Indiana University and the Mays Institute where we are pushing the frontiers of knowledge on philanthropy and philanthropy that goes to some of the basic questions of who we are and how we express our, our deepest senses of generosity. So on a more practical level, you'll be getting a uh, survey. So as, you, as, we grow, as we grow this community uh, with you, we'd like to know, did you learn what you came to learn? Uh, what else would you have liked to learn? And, and what else would you like to learn that we can help you with? So thank you again, and have a safe, uh, safe travels back home again.